Well, a happy Sabbath to each of you. Sabbath. It's good to be back at New Smyrna Beach. My wife and I came down yesterday. And the reason why we are here is because of our friends Donald and Joan. We found out they were planning to get married. So we came down for their wedding, which happened yesterday. Simple wedding, but God blessed. Amen. This afternoon, there's going to be, this evening, there's going to be a baptism. And that's what's brought us back to New Smyrna Beach. We feel like we came home. We left here, what was it, three weeks ago? Or has it been a month now? I don't know, time flies. But as I mentioned, my father had COVID. He has recovered. He's out now working again in the heat of Alabama. I'm always amazed at what he can do. He is 93, going to be 93 soon, and doesn't see well, doesn't hear well, but still walks without a cane and still is able to work. He's out picking up sticks because he lives on this 16 acre plot there in Alabama in the country. And when the wind blows, you know, the branches come down from all the trees. So he goes out, picks them up, piles them up. Works in his garden, does his weed eating. He, uh, some time ago, what was it, about two months ago, he was out mowing. He had this little diesel Kubota. And he said he started seeing smoke behind him. And then he looked behind, and here was fire coming out of his mower. <laughs> so, you know, he's not, he doesn't move very fast because he's, he's old. He cut off, I don't know how he got off the mower, he ended up burning his elbow, but the whole mower burned up. So he doesn't mow anymore, I have to take my mower over and mow for him, but he's still got his weed eater. So he's out with his weed eater, weed eating, and he'll come in to lunch, he eats lunch with us. He told us the first lunch that we were back, he said, I ate more today than I've eaten in a whole week. So, you know, COVID takes away your appetite, and he had, living alone, he just had, had no reason to eat, really. Didn't feel like eating, so he wasn't eating much of anything. You know, that's not good. You don't feed yourself, that's not healthy. So one of the benefits for us going back to care for him is that now he's able to eat with us, and so he liked the food, and he ate well, he ate more than one, the first meal with us than the whole week he'd eaten before. Of course, that helps to helps the recovery. We put him on artemisinin before we even got home. The moment I heard that he was sick with COVID, I called up my mother-in-law who lives, who lives not far away. Let me just digress for a moment. I think I told you, God has provided us a place, not ours, we're house sitting. But the house we're sitting in, we're staying in, fully furnished, not ours. People who own it live in, they've gone to Michigan to care for their relatives is right between my father's place and my mother-in-law's place. We're in the country. There's only one house between mom, my wife's mother, and my dad. That's the house we're staying in. So anyway, we were there, and he was able to come and eat with us. So when I told my mom, when I, as soon as I heard, told our mom, as soon as we heard he had COVID, we have a little bottle of artemisinin. We take it with us to Africa, you know, for malaria. Because it works better than quinine. And somebody, one of the missionaries told us, if you get malaria, this is what you take. And that's what they have been taking, I guess, for thousands of years. They use it for malaria. So we had that. And I had a bottle there in the home. I told mom, I said, can you go in? She had the key. The neighbor had the key. We used to leave the key with the neighbor when we leave. I said, go in and get that Artemis and then take it over to my dad. I called up dad and said, now this is what you should start taking. So he was already approving before we even got home. But then able to, being able to eat has certainly helped him. So he's basically recovered. We praise the Lord for that. So we thank the Lord for blessing us in returning home to care for him. But we also thank the Lord for blessing us with the opportunity to come back here to New Smyrna and share again on this special occasion our friends. A happy Sabbath to you. I've picked a topic that I've entitled, How to Live After Burial. I don't know if we, this seems like we've run off the screen. 
Any way we can fix that? I've got widescreen here for these slides rather than the normal setup, so we're wide. How to live after burial. Let's for just a moment bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word as we study from it again today. We pray for the blessing of your spirit to convict us, to lead us into all truth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In the summer of 1915, D.K. Briggs of Blackville, South Carolina, was called to attend a 30-year-old black woman, Essie Dunbar, who had suffered an attack of epilepsy. Dr. Briggs found no signs of life when he arrived and examined her, so he declared her dead. The corpse was put in a wooden coffin and the funeral was arranged for 11 o'clock the next day to allow for Essie's sister who lived in a neighboring town a chance to attend the funeral. Although the ceremony was a lengthy one with three preachers taking turns to speak, the sister still had not arrived when the ceremony ended. <laughs> and so Essie's coffin was lowered into the six foot grave and they began covering it up with dirt. When, finally, Essie's sister arrived. Unhappy with the fact that she had not been able to see her dead sister before her sister was buried, Essie's sister demanded the attendants to dig up the coffin so she could see her sister one more time before she was buried. When the screw, they dug up the coffin, when the screws were removed and the coffin lid opened, Essie sat up in the coffin and smiled at her sister. <laughs> the three ministers fell backward into the open grave. <laughs> the shortest of them suffered three broken ribs, trampled, trampled by the two other ministers who were all desperately trying to get out of the hole. The mourners, including Essie's sister, believed that she was a ghost and they fled away. When they saw that Essie had climbed out of the coffin and was pursuing after them, they rushed into town in terror. For many years, Essie was viewed with suspicion in her neighborhood. Some felt she was a zombie that had returned from the dead. She lived for another 47 years after being dug out of the grave. Our study today, how to live after burial. Now you know biblically, burial takes place when you're baptized. That's our spiritual burial. Baptism by immersion is spiritual death and burial. And our text that we just read was Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. If you'd like to turn back there again. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. The Bible says, Therefore we are buried. We are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Verse 5, for if we have been planted, and we were, I think we skipped verse 3. Know you not that so many as a, of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. All right, we did that in reverse, verses 4 and 3. Let's go down to verse 6 and 7. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Death and burial of the old life takes place in baptism. Now, Essie essentially had what we would call a near-death experience. We understand that she did not fully die because the Bible teaches us the dead know how much. Amen. The dead don't know anything. Apparently, Essie had not died. She had fainted in that epileptic attack and 
doctor didn't find any signs of life back in 1915. They didn't have all the medical uh, specialty they have today. And so they buried her. And apparently when they opened up her coffin the next day, the fresh air revived her and she sat up. She didn't really die. But is it possible to have a near-death experience in baptism? To not really be dead? That's possible. I read an interesting statement some time ago from Bible Commentary. Six Bible Commentary. It says this. The new birth is a rare experience in this age of the world. This was written a long time ago, but it's still true today. This is the reason why there are so many perplexities in the churches. Why are there so many perplexities in the churches? Because church members have not died to self. A new birth is a rare experience. Reading on, it says many. How many? Many. many. So many who assume the name of Christ are unsanctified and unholy. They have been baptized, but they were what? Buried alive. <coughs> Self did not die, and therefore they did not rise to newness of life in Christ. It's what we would call a spiritual near-death experience. Hmm. They came near to death, but they didn't fully die. So self revived, especially when church board meeting takes place. <laughs> self revives. They were buried alive. Now, there are many stories, and you probably have read them. I have read a number of stories of people that were thought dead, were buried, only to later be discovered that they weren't dead. And, of course, we just saw the experience of Essie Dunbar. That happened to her. She was not dead. She revived. Now, thankfully, she didn't revive until they opened the lid, because if she had, she would have been beating on the lid of the casket. Back in the early days, they made these caskets where when someone died, because they didn't have the medical technology we have today, they didn't embalm people. There's no way you're going to come back from near death if you've been embalmed and taken all the blood out and put in all the formaldehyde, <laughs> all that stuff. But back in the early days, they didn't do that. They would just bury people. And so what they would do, the casket designers, they would, you can see here in the design, they would tie a rope to the hand of the person buried, and up above the ground, they would have this bell. And if you heard the bell ringing, well, then they would go out and dig up the casket, and the person, well, maybe they were still alive. And that happened occasionally. But here it says, concerning spiritual death, they have been baptized, but they were, what? Buried alive. Self did not die. And therefore, they did not rise to newness of life in Christ. Now, of course, when we're baptized, we want to rise in newness of life, right? Amen. For that to happen, self must die. You understand that when someone dies, it's a shame not to bury them, right? We just leave them to rot. That's a shame. However, if they are still alive, it's a crime to bury them, right? If someone dies, it's a shame not to bury them. If they're still alive, it's a crime to bury them. And we could learn some spiritual lessons from those two thoughts. Testimonies volume 5 says, Those who accept the truth are not taught that they cannot safely be worldlings in conduct while they are Christians in name. In other words, when a person accepts Christ, they ought to look different, they ought to live different, they ought to act different, they ought to be different, right? If there's no difference, then we might question, have they really died to self? Heretofore, they were Satan's subjects, henceforth, now they've accepted Christ, or at least supposed to, henceforth they are to be subjects of Christ, the life must testify to the chains of leaders. And my question for us, each of us, is your life testify to the change of leaders? It's supposed to. Now, we're not talking about perfection here. 
Rather, baptism is a demonstration of perfect surrender. Doesn't mean you'll never make a mistake after you're baptized. But baptism is supposed to be the demonstration of perfect surrender. It's sort of like a wedding. If the couple is not in love already, the wedding service is not going to create love. It's simply a form. And it's the same in baptism. If the person has not surrendered fully to the Lord, then it's just a form. That's why the Bible says in Romans 6, verse 3 and 4, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His what? His death. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And the life needs to be a new life, a different life, not the old life that we used to live. And so our study today, how to live after burial. This is a topic for those who have been baptized, those who will be baptized, and anybody else here has been baptized. That's pretty much all of us. Amen. How to live after burial. Take notes. I'm going to give you five keys. How to live after burial. Number one. Key number one. Stay dead. <laughs> number one. Stay dead. Paul says, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into what? Into death. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, I die how often? Daily. Daily. I read from a book entitled Ministry of Healing. It says this, The life of Paul, the Apostle Paul, was a constant conflict with self. He said, I die daily. Who's this? Paul. Paul. His will and his desires every day. How many days? Yeah. Every day. Conflicted with duty and the will of God. Who's this? Paul. This is St. Paul. Is it going to be any different for you? No. If it was that way for St. Paul, it's not going to be any different for us. His will and his desires. Yeah, that's true for us as well. Every day conflicted with duty and the will of God. Instead of following inclination, what he wanted, the Apostle Paul, he did God's will, however crucifying to his nature. That's dying to self. Baptism is a demonstration of dying to self. I like the words found in Testimonies, Volume 1. It is easy living after we are dead. What's the title of our sermon today? How to live after burial. It is easy living after we are dead. Would you read that with me? It is easy living after we are dead. Let me hear you. It is easy So if you're not having the easy life, what's that say to you? I need to die. If you're not dead, what happens there in the coffin? It's a fight for survival. You ever been in church board meeting? And it seems like it's a fight for survival. <laughs> Self is not dead. So number one, key number one, how to live after burial. Number one, stay dead to self. I die daily, Paul says. Messages to young people says this, the surrender of all our powers to God greatly simplifies the problem of life. Tell me, is it easy to surrender? No. Not easy at all. But when you make the surrender, it greatly simplifies the problem of life. It's easy living after we're dead. It weakens, surrender does, it weakens and cuts short, how many? A thousand, a thousand struggles with the passions of the natural heart. The person that's in the coffin, 
that's not dead, he's got a thousand struggles trying to get out of there. You've read stories of people who were buried alive and how they just, you know, they, they finally found out later that they dug them up and here they were, they're all bloodied and they were trying to beat their way out of the coffin. It's a struggle. But when you die to self, when you make the surrender, it cuts short a thousand struggles with the passions of the natural heart. What's it say? Read with me. It is easy living after we are dead. Paul says, Colossians 2, verse 20. Read with me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Let me stop there. What's the title of our sermon? How to live after burial. Paul says, I die daily. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Now, we're read, reading on together. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. <laughs> Key number one, how to live after burial. Number one, stay dead to self. I die daily. When you are dead to self, then and only then, you can be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to live an unselfish Christian life. Desire of Ages says this, We can receive of heaven's light only as we are willing to be, what? Empty. Empty of self. That's dying to self. To all who do this, the Holy Spirit is given without measure. Would you like to receive the Holy Spirit without measure? Then what must you do? You must die to self. We have to be emptied of self before we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so number one, how to live after burial? Stay dead. I hope you were dead when we buried you. <laughs> Stay dead now. Dead to self. I die daily. Number two, if you're taking notes, number two, how to live after burial. Number two, use the Word of God. You remember that when Jesus was baptized, what happened right after his baptism? Did he go on vacation? Did he go to the beach? He went to the wilderness. And you know what happened in the wilderness? He was tempted of the devil. How did he endure the temptation? How did he, how did he resist temptation? What did he say? It is written. And that's what we must say. You've been buried. And you were baptized. You were buried. Now you're living for the Lord. When temptation comes, use the Word of God. Turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. You're in Romans. Go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. This is familiar territory for some. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. I'd like to hear the pages turning. I'm reading from the King James here. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Are you God, is God going to call you to endure something that you cannot endure? No. no. Paul is saying, there's no temptation taking you, but such is as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Listen. God makes the way, you make the escape. Amen. There is a way of escape out of every temptation. That's what the, the Word says. God is not going to take you out of the temptation. He's going to show you the way of temptation, but you've got to make the escape. Sort of like the eject button. you got to push the button. There's no power in you, but when you push the button, you can... Escape. There's a picture of somebody. This was just before the plane crashed. I guess it was an air show they were doing and something went wrong with the plane. And this guy pushed the button, the eject button, and he survived the crash. 
There is the way of escape, the button. Push that button. The power is in the Word of God. Some of you have a car that has one of those things. Push to start. There's no power in, in your finger, but you have a choice. Mm -hmm. And when you make the choice to push the button, then you, you have the, the power, right? It's sort of like the car has the engine. You don't have the power, but you have the choice. When you push the button, then that button connecting to the electrical system you know, starts the engine. Now you have power. Try pushing that car. <laughs> Not going to take you very far. <laughs> You're going to sweat, especially here in Florida. The power to move does not come from you, and it does not come from the button, but you have a choice. Mm. When you push the button, then the power is ignited, is started. Now you can move. So it is with the Word of God. Listen, education says the creative energy. How much power is that? The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is where? is in the Word of God. This Word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise. Accepted by the will. That's another word for choice. The will. Choice. Received into the soul, it brings with it the life of the Infinite One. You want power? It's in the Word. But you have to use it. Number two, how to live after burial. Number two, use the Word of God. You don't have the power, but you got the choice. You could push the button. I often say, God is not going to send an angel down to, from heaven to read your Bible to you. You have to open the Word and read it, study it. And it says, as you do that, you're connecting yourself to power, the source of all power. Steps to Christ, you all have that. If you came to our seminar, you got that. This little book says, page 47, what you need to understand is the true force of the will. That's a choice. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. Now you tell me, how much is everything? <laughs> everything depends on what? Right. Depends upon the right action of the will. I don't have the power, but I have the choice. And when I engage with God's Word, I'm getting power from, not from me, but from His Word. The power of choice. God has given to men, and it is theirs to exercise. You have something to do. That's to exercise your choice. You don't have the power, but you have the choice. Mm. You cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God his affections, but you can choose. What can you do? Choose. 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 You can choose to serve him. That's your part. You can give him your will. I say, Lord, even my choice, I give to you, that to you. I need your help. I tell people that smoke. There are two great keys to quit. Number one, I choose not to smoke. There's your choice. Number two, Jesus, help me now. Your choice, God's power. You don't have the power, but you have the choice. And so everything depends upon the right action of the will. God has given you the choice. Through the right exercise of the will, an entire change may be made in your life. Are you willing? Amen. That's the question. Are you willing? Sometimes we rise up in rebellion against the Word of God. Say, Lord, I'm not willing. <laughs> well, then that's where we have a, a struggle. One of those struggles. <coughs> Through the right exercise of the will, an entire change may be made in your life by yielding up your will to Christ. You ally yourself. You connect yourself with the... What's that word? 
with the power that is above all principalities and powers. It happens when you make the choice.